In this presentation, we will talk about the transition from the Roman Empire, the situation of a millenary empire uh, that uh, ruled over the Mediterranean, uh, to the Middle Ages, uh, so the culture that was born out of the encounter between the remnants of the Roman Empire and the new so-called barbaric cultures that uh, penetrated Europe uh, starting from the 3rd and 4th century uh, after Christ. So in our presentation today, uh, we will map the timeline of the so-called Middle Ages. Uh, we will observe uh, how Italy looks like, especially after the mark the marker, the date of year 1000, and we will trace the urban literary and visual uh, imagination of the years of the post-1000 uh, Middle Ages. So here is the map of Europe in 476, uh, which is uh, the age uh, which is conventionally used to uh, define the fall of the Roman Empire of the West. Uh, in color, you see the ancient structure of the Roman Empire. Uh, the fall of the Roman Empire of the West, so the fall of Rome, uh, actually uh, engenders a division of the empire in two parts. One uh, in the West that is fragmented in many entities and many uh, then kingdoms, and the part of the East that uh, instead is focused on the uh, capital uh, Constantinople, uh, the Istanbul of today, uh, which will outlast uh, the Western Roman Empire of a thousand years. Uh, so 1453 is the date when Byzantium or Constantinople will fall. Um, now, this is the Byzantine Empire. Uh, as you see, uh, Constantinople uh, is the capital of the eastern part. But during the Kingdom of Justinian, um, the uh, empire of the, of the eastern part of the empire manages to expand uh, to Italy as well. And in Italy, uh, the city of Ravenna will become uh, a, a key city. And together with Ravenna, also the city of Milan. Uh, so Rome loses importance. Um, at the same time, the Roman, the Roman Empire of the East, as we said, it's uh, an empire that will uh, shrink over the next thousand years uh, and it will end um, in, as we said, in 1453. Uh, one interesting event um, during this time happens in 787 in the city of Nicaea in Asia Minor. Um, especially in this city, there is a council of the Catholic Church uh, up to that point, um, which uh, opposes people that are so-called iconoclasts, so um, people who defend the idea that God is not representable through images and want to destroy uh, all the images that represent God, and people who instead um, defend the value of images uh, and defend the value of representations of, of God uh, or, or the figure of Christ. This council is particularly important to define our um, our world, our society, because like it uh, appreciates and it defines the value of images. So the representation of God is not through abstract forms, but actually through real images. So the loss of the so-called iconoclast is actually the cornerstone of our uh, Western civilization as a civilization of images. Now, during the 7th and 8th centuries, we have to consider that in the Mediterranean appears a new force, which is the force of um, the Muslim uh, empire. So starting from the uh, Arabic Peninsula, um, Muslim expansion, uh, starting from Muhammad, uh, enlarges uh, then in the Middle East, in Egypt, in Libya, and uh, arrives then to actually Spain and um, later in the 9th century to conquer Sicily as well. Now, one important date to remember is uh, 732, uh, which is the date when um, the 
Muslim expansion is stopped in uh, Poitiers, uh, in the Pyrenees, in southern France. Um, and that is the uh, point of maximum expansion of the Muslim empire. Um, this stop engenders a kind of virtual division of the Mediterranean area into a southern uh, Muslim Arabic domination and a northern, um, what we call European uh, presence, where the northern part is, as we said, divided between kind of a western part and an eastern part, uh, which is kind of like the division also within the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. So the Catholic Church or the Latin Church in the West and the Orthodox Church uh, following kind of the Greek tradition in the East. Now, also the Muslim empire will undergo uh, some shrinking over the centuries. So this is the configuration of the Muslim empire uh, in year 1000. Regarding Western Europe, uh, this is uh, how it looks like uh, in the 8th and 9th century, uh, centuries. Um, it is important to understand that uh, the old Roman empire... Uh, that was invaded by several uh, barbaric populations, so the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Huns, um, will um, be restored uh, in the 8th and 9th century uh, under one particular figure, which is the figure of Charlemagne, which actually manages to uh, create a synthesis between the Roman Empire, the old Roman Empire, and uh, Catholicism and the new idea of a Roman Empire which is holy, so uh, a Christian Roman Empire. Now, during this time, uh, I want to point your attention to a particular date which is 728. It's the date of the donation of Sutri. What is this fact? So basically, the king of Longobards uh, who was... Um, had some possessions uh, in the contemporary Lombardy, but also in central Italy, uh, basically gives a small territory as a gift to the Pope, Pope Gregory II. Uh, this is the, the possession that uh, enables the Pope to have, uh, in addition to his spiritual power, also a temporal power. So this is the beginning of the temporal power of the papacy, of the pontifical state, uh, a state which will um, end in 1870 with the seizing of Rome by the Italian state, but, but that will continue, uh, especially after the Lateran Pax of 1929, uh, as what we call the Vatican City, which is like a square mile uh, territory, but which is the place of the so-called temporal power of uh, the Pope. Now, another important event is actually uh, takes place in uh, year 800, and it's the coronation of Charlemagne, uh, the um, king that manages to unite the actual territories of France, Germany, and uh, Italy. Um, the coronation happens in Rome, but as you saw from this map, uh, the coronation um, ratifies the position of uh, a new kingdom whose um, epicenter is no longer Rome, but actually Aachen, uh, so the capital of the new empire. So the line, the idea line uh, of uh, interest is no longer the Mediterranean, but the north, northern part of Europe. Now, uh, after the death of Charlemagne, the empire uh, is divided into three parts uh, in the Treaty of Verdun of 843. And this is how Europe uh, looks like in year 1000. So we have the beginning of uh, a kingdom of France, the beginning of a uh, kingdom of England, uh, a Germany, Germanic area which is influential over northern Italy. We have the Caliphate in Spain uh, of Cordoba. Cordoba is one of the 
uh, most fascinating cities during the Middle Ages, and also, as we said, the um, Byzantine Empire under the city of Constantinople. Now, year 1000 is a particular year. Uh, it's kind of a year that uh, was supposed to coincide with the end of the world. So the uh, passing of year 1000 coincides with kind of a release uh, of tension in uh, Western uh, civilizations, but also with a radical transformation in the configuration of the city. Uh, so we move from the old idea of the rock, so the castle, the monastery, we saw in the second picture, the monastery of uh, Monte Cassino, where uh, St. Benedict uh, started uh, his rule and started like a network of convents that uh, retrace the roots of communication uh, across Europe that were uh, being destroyed by the barbaric invasions, and also the idea of a city that, that was fortified, so uh, cities that were in elevated positions. Now, the elevated um, configuration uh, of living served the purpose to control the, ter the territory, the ser served the purpose of defense, and uh, it also staged kind of a hierarchical uh, social organization um, of, of a vertical society. Uh, it's the, the society of feudalism. Uh, now, from this configuration, we move to the idea or the setting of a medieval city, which is instead organized around uh, several different uh, monuments and sites. Uh, in particular, the medieval city is centered around the palace of government. So there is a palace that stages the power of a new governor. In the medieval city, uh, there is a cathedral. Uh, this is the, the cathedral of, P of Pisa. So the place of the cathedra, the place where the bishop has uh, his chair. And the palace of government and the cathedral staged the two powers, that, uh, the secular and the religious power that rule over a city. And the city is still fortified. There are like walls. Uh, and in the city, uh, there is a new place of encounter, which is the piazza, where the secular and the religious power are often facing each other. But the piazza is the place of trade, of encounter, of um, dialogue among citizens. Now, the cities are also connected in new routes uh, that are traced around the routes of pilgrimages, like from the north of Europe to Rome, but also from France to Santiago de Compostela in uh, western Spain, uh, which was the site of the tomb of St. James. And one other route of pilgrimage is actually uh, Jerusalem, but that uh, is a route that uh, is created through the uh, Crusades. Now, the ancient Roman structures are actually used and reutilized to uh, create piazzas, roads, churches, and also the materials are reutilized. Re so, um, old structures like basilicas that were like secular structures are reinvented as religious basilicas, so churches. Um, materials, for example, from the Colosseum in Rome are used to uh, build new neighborhoods or build new uh, monuments and churches. This one, the reason why, like the Colosseum is uh, in pretty bad shape. Uh, a lot of uh, its uh, stones were stolen or reused during the Middle Ages. And also structures like the amphitheater of Lucca in Tuscany uh, were used to reconfigure a new urban space. So this is a piazza built on the structure of an amphitheater. And of course, the most important element in a medieval city, like in our cities, is that of the towers. Uh, so towers, like in San Gimignano, uh, which is kind of the New York of the Middle Ages, were uh, meant to stage the power, the verticality, uh, the elevation of the wealthiest members of the city. So um, there were a sort of skyscrapers in brick and mortar. And um, you see the image of the tower also in Bologna. And in uh, Bologna is also the site that the city where the 
first university was founded in Europe in year 1088. And also we see towers in the city of Pavia. Uh, they were staging the power of the different families that uh, built them. Now, Italy after year 1000 is marked by a significant figure, uh, the figure of Emperor Frederick I, Barbarossa. So uh, the emperor, uh, Germanic emperor, wanted to extend his influence over uh, northern Italy and wanted to actually conquer northern Italy actively. Now, one day to remember is the date of 1176, where the Battle of Legnano takes place. Uh, Legnano is in Lombardy, and uh, Legnano is the place where a number of cities of communes, so city-states of Lombardy, uh, get together in a league, the so-called Lombard League, uh, that manages to stop the invasion of Barbarossa, Friedrich I, and uh, give a new configuration of the north as a territory run by a multitude of city-states. So every city is basically a capital for itself. Now, the son of Barbarossa, Henry IV, actually marries the daughter of the Norman king of Sicily. Um, Sicily passes to uh, under normal Norman uh, domination uh, in uh, the 11th century, so it's no longer Arab, but Arabic, but uh, Norman. So the daughter of the Norman king of Sicily, um, Constance of Altavilla, marries Henry IV. And through this marriage, basically, southern Italy becomes an imperial dominion of, of the family, of the Germanic family of the Ohenstaufen, Lies Vevi, it's um, in Italian. Now, the dominion of the Ohenstaufen uh, finds its peak with Frederick II, uh, their son. And Frederick II is kind of an enlightened king uh, who rules over the Germanic areas, but also southern Italy. In 1224, he actually establishes and founds like the uh, University of Naples, which is called still today uh, Università Federico II, uh, under his name. Um, he will build one of the most gorgeous castles. Uh, it's a, kind of a fortress. Uh, in the northern part of Puglia. Uh, and this castle is uh, called Castel del Monte. It's one of the gems of medieval architecture. As we were saying, uh, Friedrich II was an enlightened emperor and under his court in Sicily, uh, actually uh, a school, a literary school develops. Um, so the notaries and the bureaucrats of his court actually start to write poems, uh, love poems, in uh, vernacular language, uh, what we call Italian. So the Sicilian school, or La Scuola Siciliana, is actually the beginning of Italian literature, in the sense that it's the first time that Latin is not used as a language of um, literary communication, but rather uh, a vernacular language. So this is something to keep in mind. Um, Italian literature is born in Sicily. Now, we talked about the pontifical state, we talked about the north, we talked about the south. Um, two cities appear in the 13th centuries as two uh, centers, two city-states that are particularly important. One is, of course, Assisi, the city of Francesco, St. Francis, uh, which becomes kind of a, a center of spiritual renewal. Uh, we were talking about the beginnings of Italian literature, and St. Francis is actually the second uh, kind of uh, center, the second site, the second protagonist of uh, the birth of Italian literature. Actually, his um, poems, religious poems, uh, are the uh, example, one of the earliest examples of use of the vernacular language for literary purposes. Now, the 13th century is also uh, the century where uh, Dante, uh, 
uh, is born. Dante grew up in, uh, grows up in the city of Florence, uh, which is one of the most important uh, cities, city states uh, in central Italy. Uh, Dante, of course, is uh, one of the leading figures of um, Italian literature. He yeah, is divine, uh, divine comedy. So in the uh, early 14th century, it will become one of, the, one of the masterpieces of Western civilization. Now, in addition to Florence and Assisi, two other cities are particularly uh, important to stress and underline. One is Siena and the other is Padova. And together with them, uh, around these four cities, I want to trace the uh, outline of the pictorial and artistic imagination. So the first figure that actually emerges as a uh, kind of leading artist in the 13th century is a figure of Cimabue who works in Florence and in Assisi. Um, Cimabue is the first painter that really tries to um, break the flat bidimensionality of painting and try to open up a more nuanced, deep idea of the representation. So we go back to the idea of um, the Council of Nicaea and the representation of images and also the transformation in this representation from B-dimensional flat images to images that entail more and more a landscape, but also a uh, representation of feelings and depth. Now, Giotto is uh, the painter that comes after Cimabue, is one of the most renowned painters of the Middle Ages. And Giotto will work in Padova, uh, where he will paint the Scrovegni Chapel, which is one of the monuments uh, that are most beloved and admired uh, in Italy. It's a sort of a um, forerunner of the Sistine Chapel. So the Scrovegni Chapel is a representation of the life and uh, the episodes of the life of Christ and uh, it's under a ceiling that is done in um, precious uh, gems. Uh, so it's a blue uh, obtained through precious gems. Uh, Giotto will also work in Assisi and he will paint in the Basilica of Assisi uh, a cycle of frescoes uh, painting the life of St. Francis and celebrating the life of St. Francis who had just lived. Um, and in Florence, Giotto will also design the bell tower of the Cathedral of Florence, which is still uh, present today. And this bell tower, as you see, is um, a tower that plays a lot on color. So it's a pictorial bell tower, which um, it's a fact that will which will influence the uh, structure and architecture of the overall church, which uh, differently from other medieval churches that uh, choose and privilege kind of an upward tension. So the verticality of the Gothic architecture actually instead privileges the idea of the variety of color. Uh, it's one of the few churches that uh, bet on the different colors. Now, the last artist, influential artist uh, of this age is Duccio, and Duccio will work in Siena, uh, where he will paint the Maestà, the Majesty, uh, which is the uh, representation of the glory of heaven. Now, this, these are some images uh, of uh, Giotto's cycle uh, of frescoes in Assisi, so the representation of, of, the, of Francis de Stimate, um, and you see the idea of perspective in this crucifix that is turned uh, the other way. Uh, this is These are some images from the uh, Scorvegni Chapel, so it's divided in a narration, like certain uh, episodes uh, with a certain rhythm. So this is the Nativity, uh, Kissing of Judah, uh, the Crucifixion, um, the Descent of the Holy Spirit, and here is the dedication of the chapel by Scrovegni, who was um, a banker, like he was also uh, involved in usury. Uh, and the chapel is a sort of like um, apology or justification for his usury. Uh, now, uh, the Middle Ages are also the time when um, banks are formed uh, in the city of Siena. Monte dei Paschi is the first bank, and uh, the banking system uh, is born out of the acknowledgement that 
uh, there is a certain amount of usury, so um, lending money with interest, uh, a certain rate of interest that is considered acceptable. So something under 10% is considered acceptable. Above that, uh, we still think of it as usury. And this is the Maesta of Duccio. It's one of the masterpieces that are uh, still uh, concerned in Siena. Uh, Siena was also the place where, uh, if you'll visit the city, um, their wealth accumulated by bankers was actually used as a way to stage the glory of the city through the construction of like the so-called kind of biggest uh, church on earth. Um, the funds uh, ended before the completion of the cathedral. So uh, what you see now uh, is just the short side of the uh, plant, which is shaped like a cross. Uh, so it was supposed to have like also a uh, long side of it. Now, the Maesta is also uh, the completion of our journey through the Middle Ages because the Middle Ages are an age that is centered on the primacy of uh, religion and the primacy of Christianity as an element that bounds uh, all society together. Uh, so the civil society and the religious society. Uh, there were some frictions between the power of the bishops or the Pope and the power of the Emperor and uh, Marquis, Dukes. Um, but in general, the binding element during these thousand years was still uh, the um, presence of Christianity. 